more people are starting to say, I keep hearing about Waterloo, like what's going on up there? What's going on up there? This isn't about empire building in this community, it's about movement building. And he, he asked us a question, he said, you guys are from Waterloo, right? And we said, yeah. And he said, oh, then I know it works. It's a, it's a fun answer. I won't tell you because you got to hear it live. Happy, right? They yeah. do. You're adorable. Chad and I are from a company called Magnet Forensics. My name is John Baker. It's Ted Hastings. Okay, well, um, so this is my apartment. <laughs> started for me probably in about grade three. We're, we're all about making the online shopping experience better. Every time it was ending, we kept saying, oh, it'd be awesome just to have our own beer to start up our own brewery. Well, I was recruited by Google. And, and something happened, something magical happened probably in the first two or three years. I used to be a professional lacrosse player. We were half a million people. But we had retained those, those small town values. I started here in the city. What Communitech has done. So since 2007. And when I became mayor, one of the first things for me was that City Hall should be open to the citizens. That's what it's all about. And so in the same way that it takes a village to raise a child, you know, it takes a community to build a strong tech company. It is 7.40 now on the Morning Edition. Good morning, my name is Craig Norris. You're listening to CBC Radio 1, 89.1 FM in Kitchener, Waterloo, and Cambridge. It is a gorgeous sunny day out there. Filmmaker and local photographer Taylor Jackson joins me this morning in studio. Good morning, Taylor. Good morning. This all started in September of 2011. I was visiting a friend from China. He's from Waterloo, but moved to Shanghai to finish school and ended up starting his own company. His concept was simple, create a bike shop that built up the community around it. The more we talked about this idea of a business building up the community, we realized that that's exactly what Waterloo is all about. So when I got home from China, we started this journey to figure it all out. There are thousands of new startups each year, but what makes the ones from Waterloo any different? I'm not sure it's something we'll ever be able to nail down to an exact science or duplicate in other places, but I know one thing for sure, there's no other place in the world like this one here. Just to give you an example of peculiar this place is. So once upon a time, this community had uh, grocery stores. They had A&P, Atlantic and Pacific, uh, very old brand. They had uh, Dominion stores. You probably don't even remember Dominion stores. Hmm? They had Loblaws stores. So they had A&P, Dominion, and Loblaws. These are the great national chains at the time. And every single one of them driven out of the community, right? And where did they go? Why is there no Loblaws in Waterloo Region? All over Toronto, all over, you know? So one of Canada's leading grocery retailers, itself an entrepreneurial f family. But what's it about Waterloo Region that you can't find a Loblaws store? And you can't. It is because Loblaws was driven out. Now that's interesting that a national brand in a small jurisdiction cannot overcome the local competition. Like how, how sophisticated local competition be when you, you know, volume, discounts, advertising, the whole bit. Well, they're all gone. Used to be two in downtown Kitchener, for example. Both of them gone. It was, of course, because there was a local entrepreneur, Mr. Zare, who decided he could do it better, and the local community supported him. And that's why all of his community are Zare's stores. Yes, owned by Loblaws. Because the only way they could get back in the local community is to buy the local brand. There was a cluster of small companies that had maybe half a dozen people in them, uh, and there were probably about half a dozen of us. And uh, folks like uh, Jim Balsley, uh, Randall Howard, uh, Jim Estel, uh, and a variety of others that were all part of the original uh, group of companies. And Google wasn't sure what we wanted to do here long term. Google just knew something amazing was happening here. Like when I talked to the people who actually chose this location uh, before I came to Google, they were like, we're not sure what's going on, but we need to figure it out, it's really great. 
And right from day one, it was being involved in the community here and being present in the community here means you need to be participative in building the community long term. I ran a company in England uh, and then I moved to Australia. So I was actually living in Sydney and uh, I met a Canadian girl. It was just the perfect mix of everything that I really look for in a place. So I had arts and culture, technology and business and it was just this amazing hybrid. I think one of the reasons that we love it here is, is it's the perfect place for us to bring up a family and start a business. Great talent, both you know, on the engineering side, sales and marketing. There's an increasingly strong culture here in this community that builds on all of the entrepreneurship that this community is known for. I got up this morning at, at 6.15 and I didn't know what I was going to do today. But I knew I was going to change things, that I was going to improve some things. I was probably going to screw up some things too. It comes with the territory. I mean, really, innovation and entrepreneurship is about failing forward. And as you learn from each little face plant, uh, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I, don't, I shouldn't do that again. I'm going to try something a little bit different. The only time you really fail is when you stop. Everything else is okay. That's, that's innovation. Once you get a taste of doing something on your own, um, taking a risk with your own money, and then potentially seeing an upside and making decisions and kind of controlling your own direction, uh, I think there's a, an addiction that starts to form and you always start looking for opportunities to either make money or, or make a significant change in the world. When, when we were going through the discussions with Google about um, joining and, and being acquired, one of, the, one of the things that came up pretty quickly was that they wanted us to, to move to Mountain View. And this was something that, as a team, we didn't want to do. Uh, we really love Kitchener Waterloo and wanted to remain here. It would have been such a great loss to have us grow here and consume all these resources and then leave. Michael Litt. So we first met each other in high school. Uh, and then I also went to the same university. So I did systems design engineering. He did mechatronics. Then we both got a co-op term in California. So I really wanted him to get that job, and he really wanted to move down to the valley. So I said, hey, we should live together. We're both going to be there. Um, he had lived there before. He said, yeah, this is an awesome place to, to live. So him and I were roommates while we were at Cyprus. Uh, we worked in the same cubicle at work. We lived in the same one-bedroom apartment. Um, he, he took the main room, and I had the bedroom. Uh, we had the air mattress fortress that he lived in, and we just like went out every weekend together, had an awesome time. He introduced me to his friend group in California. We've been close now. We're partners in our in our fund called Garage Capital, with along with Devin, um, and we try to work together as much as possible. He was the first one who started um, this path of going down to YC, raising money, and then bringing it all back. And I said, you've got to apply to YC. Application deadline is today. He didn't think it was right for them, and they were a hardware company, and they were more of a logistics problem than a software or hardware problem, to be honest. And I remember um, talking to him at one point about us going to another accelerator program, and he asked, he said, did you apply to YC? And I turned to him and I said, no, like, we, don't, we don't know if it's the right fit for us, we're hardware, um, this other accelerator that we're going to go to or we're thinking of going to is a little bit more focused, I think it's the best fit for us. And he said, go over to your desk and apply to Y Combinator. You know, I told him about our experience, pushed him really hard. We almost got into a fist fight over it, but ultimately he sat down, did his app, got the guys to do the video, and uh, I think YC was obviously pretty, pretty successful for them. And he's always um, willing to make that first step and really create a path. Um, and so we followed in that same path and went to YC, had an awesome experience, raised some money there, and then brought it back to Kishinwalu because we love this community. Um, and Thalmic Labs has done the same thing now. To be honest, when you know I first saw what Steven and the guys were working on, I thought it was it was crazy. In fact, I still think it's pretty crazy. Um, but it's something that you know has the capacity to change the world. And just like Rim invented the mobile internet, you know he's inventing uh, an aspect of of wearable computing. 
Yeah, so we uh, unveiled the Mayo, which is a device we make uh, to the public end of February this year. And so we launched a pre-order campaign. Uh, we've had over 35,000 customers in over 140 countries pre-order the device, um, which will ship the first ones at the end of this year. Uh, the first prototype we built, we built it right here actually in Velocity. Um, I think a week after we graduated, we moved in here. And about two months in there, we had this like really, really crude prototype. It had like stick on medical electrodes uh, and like wires coming off your arm. And it was like a circuit board just hacked together on top of what's called an Arduino. It's like a prototyping thing. Big USB cable to the computer. Like it looked like a really some kind of, you know, torture device or something. Like it did not look like a, a product at all, but it worked. And we were able to actually, we have a video somewhere of us controlling like PowerPoint by going left and right. And this is like a few months into working on it. Um, you know, it, it's been a long ride uphill since then to get to what it is today, but that first kind of proof of concept, that first prototype was a really big step for us. Good over top. <laughs> hey, you didn't see this, Matt. You need a new job? Hey? You need a new job? <laughs> Me? Yeah. This on the Facebook page. So should we Instagram video this? It's only illegal if you get caught. Right? It's your job to watch the cops. It's the famous elevator ride. We shot our dandy application video and Taylor fell backwards. <laughs> we shoot like a three minute video to get into this hyper drive accelerator. And I think we got two minutes in and we we're like, there's nothing more for us to talk about. So we just put like a minute and a half or a minute of blooper reels going up there. Good. So this is Dandelion 2.0. Original office was down in the uh, hyperdrive accelerator. So we just moved into this place. We haven't got all of our furniture and everything yet, but should have done this like MTV Cribs, like you should be on the inside. Yo, what's up guys? It's Taylor from Dandy. We have a good view of our, our old hyperdrive spot. It was literally right down here. A million dollar game. Next time you see it though, it will be a legit office. Yeah, hopefully. And then of course, my beloved University of Waterloo. It is its own strange entrepreneurial endeavor. It is a social, uh, entrepreneur, act of entrepreneurship, but still is an act of entrepreneurship. Imagine a university created by business persons. See, something about that doesn't sound right, does it? Not by a government commission, not by a royal commission, not by a bunch of scholars who said, ah, we must have a university. No, local business persons. Uh, fourth year engineering, uh, you have to do a design project and wanted to find a way of incorporating what we were doing as a company into my academic career. And we were able to get a degree while we built a lot of the technology behind the product. And so University of Waterloo is, is unique in that they don't take any IP in what you create during undergrad. Uh, we called it Vidyard uh, in about January of 2011 and had a, a functional product with about 15 customers by the time April, May rolled around. Uh, so we have this hardware kiosk that has a bunch of compartments of different sizes. Um, the recipient gets an email uh, as soon as the package is ready for pickup and then they can go and pick it up at a convenience store, a grocery store, or any one of our other locations. We also have uh, transit hubs. That was our final year design project when we were still, the three of us founders, all in engineering. Uh, when Andrew, Jackie, and I set up Tech Capital Partners in uh, 2001, one of the reasons we, we looked at this area was because we said we can build an entirely diverse technology portfolio within the boundary of Waterloo Region. So you combine that with the University of Waterloo's intellectual property policy, which says the the inventor owns full stop. So as investors, uh, investors come in, if they talk to a faculty member or they talk to a student, they cut a deal to invest in their company. That's all they have to do. They don't have to then negotiate with the university the way they would on any other campus. Where else could you go that there are 50,000 students looking for jobs and creating opportunities and where they can keep their intellectual property because of University of Waterloo's uh, great visionary policy? Uh, where would you else find a company like RIM, who is now BlackBerry, who started out with a, a young man in the 1980s saying, I think that we should make pagers into something more. And the brand of Waterloo Region is big enough and strong enough that it attracts you know, the smartest researchers, the smartest um, talent from around the globe, the smartest students to come here and study. These are kids who like, 
they they go to school, they go to work, they go to school, they go to work for five years. They complete six jobs by the time they graduate. So when they they go full time and they're you know working at Google or Facebook or Kick, they've already like been there, done that. And so when they go up against a kid from Stanford or MIT, these kids who are you know the best in the world, like academically, yes, you're very smart. But this is my seventh time starting a real tech job, and this is your first time. Well, Open Text is one of the first startups. Uh, a spin-off of the University of Waterloo, and I joined up with some of the professors uh, that had already started the company a few years earlier, uh, and we decided to grow it. Last night, um, I happened to be chatting with a couple of my uh, batchmates from when we went to Y Combinator, and I've had a, several of them reach out to me asking about how they can get connected to the University of Waterloo to hire students. You know, they're not satisfied with being the best in Canada. Um, you know, to them that's kind of like being the fastest runner in their grade 6 class. Their mother cares, but no one else cares. And so I think people are really big, dreaming big. To get these companies going, you need irrational money, right? Like if you're a, a banker or a lawyer and you're like, you know, you got your spreadsheet out, you're like, okay, what return am I going to make? Every single time you're going to walk away being like, I should not make this investment. Because like, rationally, this is just crazy. And that's why you really need the people who've been there, done that, who have, you know, seen crazy work. And, and feel this obligation to give back, to to be irrational, to put that money in, and that's where I think like Waterloo will really tip, is when is when you have this critical mass of people just throwing money at, at these brilliant students coming out of UW, that that things will really start to explode. And I think we're like just starting to hit that uh, with Bufferbox and Vidyard and all these other companies. Thank you and welcome to the Velocity Venture Fund Finals. So the goal today is to hand out four checks of $25,000 and I've got 10 teams who desperately want to hold that check at the end of today. And we're feeling pretty good about the pitch. We've practiced a lot. Um, we feel we have a product that solves a big problem. But just like everyone else, we're a little bit nervous. First winner of the Velocity Venture Fund Spring 2013, Kite Kabak. They are at the intersection of wearables and health, and their aim is to change the way we interact with our health. Um, I was actually part of the first class of Velocity back in the fall of 2008. Uh, we launched Pebble on Kickstarter um, with many variations of Impulse, which was our first watch, and we were actually just making watches in the garage. Like, we had a little assembly line going back there where we had some people, you know, like, fiddling around and assembling. And we've seen enough startups fail at this point to know what usually predicts it. So one of the biggest teaching points that we have is that every startup founder thinks that their idea is the next great Facebook or Amazon or what have you, right? Yet we know that 80% of startups are going to fail. So why is that? And our belief is that it's because startup founders get disconnected from the marketplace that they're trying to target. They start breathing their own fumes, they start talking to investors, they start tar talking to their friends. Everyone thinks it's a great idea, no one asks the customers what they think. So that's our fundamental pre premise with this program. We are very lucky in this community to have two organizations, Communitech and the Accelerator Center, um, that both foster early stage technology. So the Accelerator Center started actually physically open in May of 2006. It was the brainchild of uh, a number of community people that came together and, and they said, uh, we really need to have a physical place for early stage technology company startups 
uh, to come and, and be under one roof and, and benefit from the resources that are in the community. Community Tech has been successful because we've always run the place like a startup. Um, and that really starts at the board level. If you look at the founders of Community Tech 16 years ago, they were all founders, you know, CEOs themselves. And that culture is important because it trickles down to the organization. Is this started to create, uh, working together with the Accelerator Center, places where entrepreneurs could go and have a lawyer, have an accountant, have a marketing expert, all within walking distance. And that was when Communitech was still just a, a baby startup company itself. I went in when it was almost three years old and uh, it was struggling to come up with programs, but we were in the process of designing some really, really cool and meaningful programs like the peer-to-peer -peer groups, which still run today. Uh, today, uh, I'm actually the chair of the board for Communitech. Uh, and it's a, it's a great board. Like it's a, What's amazing and what they've done is they've got a great balance between CEOs of technology companies in the community. I specifically moved to Waterloo because our company was, was accepted into Hyperdrive, Communitech's accelerator program. So for a year we had been operating um, our business with next to no overhead like most startups do. So we're actually part of another accelerator program already, uh, the Accelerator Center, but it's a two-year long program. Hyperdrive is a kind of a, a shorter sprint, a little bit more intense for our early part of your business. So we apply online and you kind of get through a pre-filtering. And then uh, you have to come in and do like the first, there's a boardroom full of people in there and you give your pitch for three minutes and then they grill you for seven minutes. And you sit on pins and needles for two or three weeks waiting to find out if you got in. And then you find out you got in and you got to wait for two or three more weeks before you're allowed to tell anybody. <laughs> So we're here, we're kind of just outside of the backyard here at the Tannery or where Communitech is and it's the second day of the Hyperdrive cohort. So uh, we have basically had to give our 60 second or two minute pitch 32 times in the last two days. And we finally brought kind of the bigger audience and revealed that this is the new 11 companies that make up the third cohort of, uh, of Hyperdrive. Part of Hyperdrive is that you get this seed funding of 40,000 and then if you do well, there's the opportunity to earn the 150000 to follow on. And we were really lucky to have the support of not only University of Waterloo, but also just the Waterloo community. Block, block three brewing. Well, they're, they're doing everything themselves. I think in terms of uh, getting the inside renovated, their vats showed up last week. Well, Brian not only is a handyman when it comes to brewing the beers, but he's also a handyman when it comes to a lot of uh, the professional work that's done in here. Uh, we started up a, a beer club together, and uh, every time it was ending, we kept saying, oh, it'd be awesome just to have our own beer, to start up our own brewery. As soon as we contacted the township, they're like, yep, 100%, here's the people you need to be in touch with, here's a building for you. It's like, holy smokes. So getting into this, I was a little bit nervous because I already had a great job. Uh, well-paying, benefits, you know, great people to work with, but I was at a point in my life where I was ready to try something new. You know, being young, 23 years old, you know, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, I don't have a house, I don't have any debt. I'm okay to either trip, fall, or succeed. Like, there's only one way to know that you're gonna make it work, and that's to try. You have to try. And uh, moving on to something with such a massive amount of risk, there's so much work ahead of you, there's long hours, there's tough nights, there's sleepless nights, there's days where you don't eat, you don't sleep, you don't think, you don't do anything but work. And you just work and work and work. But I was ready for it. And taking the risk didn't seem like that big of a risk anymore. And uh, now seeing it come to fruition, like the building is coming together, I'm ready to brew in about a week and a half. This is my dream come true. Everyone in this industry is just all about like friendship, working together. You know, oh, you know, where did you order your malts? Oh, this is where I got them from. This is the price I paid. Here's my contact. I'll phone them and make sure they're not ripping you off. It's like, whoa, and we're selling to the same market, right? So it's pretty cool. Everyone kind of understands that, uh, you know, we're all in it together and that there's a big enough share for everybody. Uh, it started for me probably in about grade three. Uh, my grandfather would go to North Carolina and bring home a big crate of firecrackers or black cats. 
and uh, I'd have 72 packs and that's what I would get a year and I'd bring them to school and hang out with friends and stuff and they'd almost want them and firecrackers are in pretty high demand and there was a very short supply so we had two paper routes ongoing uh, and there'd always be kids that would run around and deliver papers with me I'd just kind of man the cart so that was kind of my first management experience and they would get paid in firecrackers for helping me with the paper routes and uh, I ended up uh, applying for a bunch of jobs in Silicon Valley because it just seemed like the place to be obviously for a young entrepreneurial guy who was interested in software and hardware engineering so went out to California emailed a bunch of companies I got an interview with Cypress Semiconductor and started there as a platform marketing engineer and Devin flew out to California to drive back to Waterloo with me because I drove my old diesel jet out there and uh, on the way back, we started thinking about you know, some cool ideas and things we could do uh, to make money and start a business so that we wouldn't have to work when we graduated. So we've had the problem of not having any desks in our office, our new office, and uh, we just ran into my aunt who runs the MCL building over here on King. And uh, Honest Lawyer left a few weeks ago. Uh, I guess they left at like 3 a.m. or something and left all of their uh, like restaurant stuff there. So on the front patio they have a bunch of bright orange uh, picnic tables. And uh, I think we're going to make those our new desks. Oh, I'm coding. Like a, basically a boardroom table. Alright, let's go. Mentorship is an interesting one in that I, I used to feel like it was a bit of a euphemism or I, I didn't really really believe in this idea of mentorship. Um, and uh, But in the past couple of years have come to define it as two people who are both at different stages of a similar journey of impact who are investing in each other's development. And that can be really powerful. You, you have that Number one, you have someone to go to. So people have been through it before and they can, you know, those problems that you're going to face or any company will face in their growth, they've already been there and faced it, so they can help you with that. Um, but also just kind of from like the inspirational point of view of like, wow, those guys 20 feet away, they're not that much different than us. And so I love being able to meet meet people. Oftentimes people reach out to me all the time and it's always 8.30 in the morning at Balzac's. That's when I meet. And so I look at the next day that's available in the calendar and be like, yeah, sure, does this day work at, at 8.30? And that allows me to know whether that founder is really for real or not because it's 8.30 in the morning and it's early. Um, and it also allows me to get up early and, and get, get a good meeting in before the day. And, and I usually really enjoy those days. Like a critical mass of role models then becomes self-sustaining. And if you're in an environment which you have a generally relatively affluent, broad community like Ontario, and if it's relatively growing, and there are trade connections, I think it, it just picks up this momentum. You know, the difference in this community versus other communities is that in this community, you know, when you ask someone to uh, meet with a startup, um, the question is never, you know, if, it's always when. I, I do the best I can to serve in as advisor in a way that I think many people in this community do, which is not as a paid advisor, not as I'll sit on your board for some stock options. It's just you have a question, can I help out because someone helped me out a decade plus ago and as a result they get to run some businesses today. You used to be able to get uh, the odd nod south of the border for Waterloo, largely because Microsoft hired a lot of graduates from U of W and of course the programs are world class. But not like now. Now you can literally travel anywhere in the world and people know the town of Waterloo. And uh, I tell you, that, that was something we just never could have imagined.
I got accepted to a couple different universities in Canada and decided to go with University of Waterloo to study architecture. Architecture is a pretty well-rounded education. I didn't want to do engineering specifically. I didn't want to do design specifically, so I kind of went for that. And what's great about it is that with UW, you get to do all these different co-op programs. So my first co-op, I worked in Paris, and then I worked in New York City, and then I worked in Toronto, and then I got to come out here to Shanghai. Uh, my co-op out here was for one year that I ended up staying. Uh, I actually liked it so much even more that I continued my studies from UW in Hong Kong University. And in the meantime, I started a blog that was about bike polo, and so I started organizing bike polo events, started doing weekly rides, um, and I transformed that site, that, that blog, into what's now one of China's most popular cycling sites, and it's in English and Chinese. And then once a year, we started organizing this really big event called the Shanghai Alley Cat. It's basically a nonlinear race throughout the city with different checkpoints. Ours now has grown to the biggest one in the entire world. It's entirely free. It's three days of, of all free stuff. You get free swag, free gift bags, everything. It's, it's awesome. Um, it started off as kind of a workshop for the community, so we spend a bunch of money to buy tools that anybody could use. And that's still our policy, like if anyone wants to stop through, they just use it as long as we're here to supervise. So it's a pretty open environment, and so everything we do has always been for free, it's always non-profit, and it's just like to support the growing scene. We just signed the lease for the space behind that wall with all the frames, which is really nice. So we're opening a small bar cafe, so kind of like a little, little bike bar cafe. We've already got enough good space outside people can hang out, and this way they can come and have a space to chill, have a drink, maybe play some video games, get a foosball table. Like. And so it all just happened very naturally and just like, just complete organic growth of a community. Yeah, it's pretty mind-blowing. This book? Yeah, that one's good. To be honest, like, I, sometimes I still can't wrap my head around it. And sometimes I wake up, I'm like, man, if I owned my own business in Canada, that'd be crazy enough. And like, yeah. now nah, I've got my own business in China, which is super weird. There's these success stories of Bufferbox YC, Vidyard YC, Pebble YC, Thomic YC, and so people, you know, apply en masse. And uh, this year we actually had a record number of, of YC interviews for UW Velocity startups. We flew, flew down here with another group from Velocity. Um, the interview uh, is just, I think it's about five minutes. Um, seems a lot shorter than that. Seems a lot shorter than that. Time races when back. you're in the interview. And then later that day, they tell you whether you're in or out. And uh, we got the phone call that we were in. I don't know how far we would be without uh, a community support. Like It's like a family back in, in Waterloo. Blackberry's been pretty incredible with the whole uh, launch on uh, Z10. We've had a number of incredible introductions made by the teams. And they'd help us out and they'd turn around the, the app release within minutes. We're very excited about uh, a review for Blackberry. Being able to come out here allows that bridge to be connected between Waterloo and Silicon Valley and I think that's where the power is and I think that's where Waterloo really needs to focus their energy on making those right connections but not trying to imitate the valley and not trying to um, do what has already been built here. I used to be a professional lacrosse player and uh, we lived in San Jose, California and uh, I was training to go back to the season and all of a sudden, I, uh, on a Saturday morning, I got up off the couch to go to the bathroom and fell flat on my face. And uh, long story short, I ended up in the hospital, I found out that I have this neuromuscular disease and I, uh, it looks a lot like Parkinson's. I can't use my hands and my feet and I'm really uncoordinated. And it lasts for anywhere from seven to, seven to like 25 days. And it kind of comes back every once in a while. He had this moment where he realized that he needed to um, focus on the positive. I was eight and a half months pregnant and uh, I had a husband who I wasn't sure was going to be able to walk again. The kind of the crux of it was I had to get help to the bathroom because I didn't want to use the, uh, I didn't want to pee in a cup, essentially. And uh, halfway to the bathroom one day, the nurse said, you better get used to this because you're going to be like this for a long time. And that made me feel terrible. Uh, for the rest of the day, I just laid in bed feeling sorry for myself. And then uh, right after dinner later that day, another nurse came on, and uh, she was helping me to the bathroom the exact same way, and 
about that same point, we stopped halfway to the bathroom and she said, don't worry about this, sweetheart, you're going to be back on your feet in no time. And it made me feel entirely different. What we did was we just said what made us happy every day, even if we had the most horrible day, if it was the crappiest day, we would smile and say, this is what we're grateful for. And it took us out of a really bad place. And we moved back to Waterloo and um, went back to Laurier. I started by studying post-traumatic growth. So why is it that when people have catastrophic events, are some people better because of the event, whereas other people have post-traumatic stress? And uh, so I learned all this about gratitude journaling, which was just focusing every day on what you're grateful for. And all of a sudden one day I decided to post a picture and it had a little note on it that said, listening to my kids giggle in the bathtub. And that's what made me grateful that day. And what happened was crazy. We had 140 different countries, people from around the world sending back these gratitude posts um, about their lives. And it kind of made us feel like we're in this with you. And then uh, we met some wonderful people who work with us now. And they said, we can make that into an app where people can share what makes them happy every day. People would take it into work and uh, they started doing this 30 day challenge at work. People were saying, oh, my team is awesome. They're doing this every day and it's making us collaborate and we're stopping what we're doing in the middle of the day to, to celebrate what's awesome about our team and we've never done this before. You really need to bring it into work. And now we're building a software that helps people to be happier in the workplace. A much bigger project but founded essentially on what we did before, which was helping people to refocus on what's positive instead of focusing on what's, what's wrong or bad. Or There's enough of that that happens <laughs> on its own. It's part of our DNA to work together and collaborate and I don't see this in other communities and I've traveled and I get asked this all the time, well what makes you guys do, why are you guys doing this? The great thing about this community is we help each other. Um, when I was running Tech Capital or was at the Accelerator Centre, if I had entrepreneurs that, uh, that needed help, CEOs of companies, founders of companies, there's a whole network that they can go to. There's this really incredible spirit of cooperation here where it's not about me beating you to the funding. It's about how do we get everybody to a place where you're fundable. I think you have a bit of a responsibility to get involved and help grow a community. You know, it's a, it's a give and take relationship. You want to meet with somebody, it's no question. Yes, I would love to meet with you. I'd love to have coffee or beers and talk to you about your business. Everything from our finance team to our human resources to our marketing team is led by volunteers, supported by volunteers, executed by volunteers. At the end of the day, you have to work with the resources you, you have. Many people come into this community and say, can you teach us how to build an ecosystem? And you can't build an ecosystem from scratch. You have to leverage what you've got. I think having a strong post-secondary institution is, is critical. But more importantly, you need a community that understands that working collectively and working together, that's what will allow uh, the community to grow. Waterloo has had a remarkable history of entrepreneurship. And as each cycle comes to an end, a new cycle begins. But in that intervening period, it's very difficult for the new cycle, in this case tech, to start attracting people to come to what was in effect a textile and automotive area. So I couldn't imagine us having the opportunities that we've earned but earned with the support of the ecosystem. I couldn't imagine doing it anywhere else. Uh, here in Waterloo, it's the entrepreneurs. They, they are the celebrated group in town. So if you're an entrepreneur, you really want to come to Waterloo Region because quite frankly, you've come home. But the truth is, there are some aspects of the Canadian personality that may be holding us back. I really don't think it's a matter of whether we're nice or not. I think we often don't dream as aggressively as people in other countries do. We have to forget that we're in southwestern Ontario. Um, we have to start thinking in a more global way. Taking risks is what moves us forward as a society. And to me, it's about, okay, we gotta keep dreaming big and keep coming up with new ideas and keep supporting others that have new ideas. And saying, you know, why can't we do that? And now we've got case studies and case histories that prove that we do. It's that human drive to, uh, to be creative, be daring,
to take uh, to take risks. And if we start to believe that and have confidence in our competence to do that, then what we form is a combination of the local energy and talent with the global marketplace. And that ripple effect of taking solutions from the community level, understanding the core of them, and then starting to share that with others, that is much more inspiring. The key is we need to keep reminding ourselves that in order to innovate, we have to fail. That's where it starts. You actually have to believe you're capable of doing those things. And the wonderful thing about Waterloo is we have examples of people who have done that. They live here. They still work here. They give their time back into this ecosystem. And I think as long as we continue to practice that, to that notion of let's try things, let's experiment, that's how we'll end up ultimately being successful in the long run. So here, in the Waterloo region, we can change the world. So what's changed since June? So we moved into this office, uh, our official lease start date was May 1st. Uh, we were 18 people. So in June we would have been about 25, 26. Um, we've just passed 40 actually. So we've nearly doubled the size of the team uh, in the eight month period, which is pretty cool. And uh, I actually I had a rough idea that it was the end of summer and I looked up some revenue growth numbers and we're about three and a half X. Um, in run rate where we were the last time we met which is awesome with about twice twice the team so it's been an exciting exciting year for us to say the least I mean having someone come to you um, and start a discussion uh, that ultimately ends in uh, having to turn down 
um, a product that and a service that you created um, from nothing uh, and got to to a significant stage it was never going to be an easy uh, conversation and I think um, we learned a lot from it um, that's for sure and it gave us a lot of new perspective on how a big organization needs to think about difficult decisions like that and it allowed us to uh, separate ourselves from uh, the personal feeling and emotional attachment that we have uh, for Bufferbox. It's, it's our baby after all. Um, and allowed us to think about the big picture. I mentioned uh, last time we chatted um, the fund Garage Capital. And uh, so Devin and Mike and I are still, still working away at that. And over the past uh, eight months, we've actually, or eight months rather, we've done seven deals. Uh, which is awesome in in local companies. Um, Sothalmic Labs is kind of the first of those, um, but we've seen an unbelievable amount of growth in in the tech scene. Do I consider Buffer Boss a success? Um, of course, of course. Um, it, it has been uh, an amazing story, uh, and to me, uh, a, an amazing life experience. But I think for the Waterloo community, it's also been uh, an amazing success. Uh, when we moved into this office uh, last April, there was tons of square footage available for startups in, in the downtown community. Uh, this was about as far into Kitchener as, as you'd want to go. Uh, and we started kind of looking at some new office space since our team has, has doubled in size. We're, we're kind of bursting at the seams and everybody's here. And there's no office space available uh, in, in gentrified buildings that are move-in ready, which is a really good sign. I mean, everything's been filled up. Uh, you go to coffee shops, you know, the conversations are entirely different. It's hard to put a, a quantifiable data point around it, but it just feels like there's even more energy than there was last time we chatted, which is really cool. I think when I think back to when I was uh, going through school and the things that I would have appreciated people telling me, and, and I think that we can share now, is the world is, is such a different place now with, with this magical thing called the internet. And I think it's allowed us to uh, build things that, that we see the world being a better place with um, without anyone's permission. And Alexis Ohanian, uh, the founder of Reddit, this is his motto, is, is why do we need to ask for someone's permission to do something? Uh, and I think we need to uh, instill that in the young minds of our world and allow them um, to continue to have that creative mind that we all had when we were young and be able to use it to create new things uh, and make this world a better place uh, without worrying about other people's validation and their permission. So Thalmic Labs, um, they're just in the office behind us. Um, their office is very grown up compared to ours. Uh, and I'm a little jealous of their space, to be honest. Um, but they're, I mean, what they're working on is just so next level. Uh, it just makes my knees feel weak. It's so incredible, and it's being built right here in the backyard. It's probably one of the most innovative technologies that you know this world has seen in a long time. In July, we would have been, uh, it was just after we raised our, our Series A, um, probably 25 people-ish then, um, almost double that now. So it's, it's been pretty phenomenal growth. So the, the back half, probably from right about here, Actually, no, you can see like this line on the ceiling. So I used to divide off this into two different spaces. Yeah. And they had the back half was a nightclub called Club Ren. And then the front was like various things. It was um, Charlie's restaurant, it was like an Italian restaurant. Um, it was a bakery at one point, a factory, I think before that. So it's been all sorts of different things. Like and we came in basically and just gutted everything out. Like this nightclub was all like paneled. You couldn't see the wood beams or anything. Like dark, gloomy nightclub. And they ripped it all out, sandblasted everything and just turned it into this. Yeah, yeah, and we actually have a new addition to the Vidyard team. Version of a V-Bot built. Probably won't be able to get this all in the shot. But uh, we're gonna bring this bad boy to conferences and you'll probably see him on the streets of Kitchener from time to time. Selling Vidyard and helping people with all their video problems. It's pretty cool. But yeah. Uh, well, they say you don't hit a successful uh, business mark until about three years out, but I'd say we're on track for that anyways. Yeah, I'll leave it on if you want. Let me see my ugly mug. Um, it's just been a massive amount of growth in the past few months, and we've only been open seven months. So having that ability to grow already is scary, but at the same time, it's, it's great. We're just carrying by with enough product that we can supply our bars and restaurants and uh, everyone seems happy, we're happy. It's just 
you know, trying to keep up is the biggest problem right now. Anything else you have to say about the past eight months of your life? <laughs> <laughs> I have never eaten as little, I've never slept so little, but I've never loved it so much.